So we're going to be talking about ways to improve IBS. And we can call that irritable bowel. We can call that inflammatory bowel. It can go either way. IBS, constipation, indigestion, heartburn, and other leaky gut-based types of conditions. So we're going to go deep. You're going to learn things that you didn't know. You're going to learn things that probably shock you. And that's the whole point, right? So before we dive in, let's talk about functionality, the five barriers of the GI tract. Now, it's important to understand these five barriers because the barriers set the stage for healthy gut and healthy food tolerance. When these barriers are breached, when they're broken down, what ends up happening is problems, right? When these barriers are broken. So think of your gut. If I could just describe your gut for you, your gut from your mouth to your anus is a tube that runs on the inside of your body. It is not part of your bloodstream and it's designed on purpose for that intent, meaning it's not connected directly to your bloodstream. That's why we have barriers. These are barriers, okay? These are barriers to the GI tract, meaning they help keep the quarantine zone of your gut from leaking into your bloodstream. Imagine poop leaking into your bloodstream. That's what we don't want. Imagine proteins that are, are harmful, plant proteins, animal pro proteins that are harmful unless properly broken down. Imagine chemicals in your food or bacteria or viruses or other fungal elements or parasitic microorganisms in your food. Your gut's job is to take those things and destroy and separate them, form poop with them and get them out, excrete them out through your anus. It is not to allow those things to leak into your bloodstream because once they start leaking into your bloodstream, we can get systemic inflammation, and it's that systemic inflammation, systemic meaning throughout your entire body, that can start to deteriorate and break your health down slowly, creating chronic inflammatory diseases, many of which are autoimmune problems, autoimmune diseases like hypothyroidism, autoimmune diseases like rheumatoid arthritis and type 1 diabetes, autoimmune diseases like ankylosing spondylitis and Reiter's syndrome and Sjogren's and Hashimoto's. So, Stay with me because this topic is super important. Now, again, five barriers. What are they? The first we talk about is probably one of the most important is the GALT. Now, the GALT, that stands for gastro-associated lymphoid tissue. This is like a massive set of tonsils that wraps around your small intestine. And researchers kind of argue back and forth that 70 to 80% of your entire immune system is in your gut. Now that should tell you something, that the grand design of your body thought it necessary to focus that much immune power right here. Why? Because what's coming into your mouth, what's coming through your mouth has the potential to be very, very dangerous to your bloodstream unless it's properly, again, properly broken down and vetted. Okay, and so the immune system is super ultra concentrated in the gut for that reason. It's to protect you from those things. So GALT, very important. The second barrier are your tight junctions. These are the, the bridges in between gut cells. So imagine this is a gut cell over here. This is a gut cell over here. In between, there's these little bridges, these little anchors called tight junctions. It's what keeps things from leaking okay into over here's your blood and up here is your gut so things leak through those two cells leak in between you can see it a little bit better here if things leak in between the two cells they hit your bloodstream and when they hit your bloodstream that's systemic inflammation so it creates a lot of problems so these tight junctions are very important this is one of the reasons why we focus so heavily on a gluten grain free diet because it's been very well established that gluten, even in people that are not celiac, gluten in non-celiacs causes a disruption of these tight junctions. And so that's very, very important to understand. We don't want a disruption in those tight junctions. That allows all kinds of garbage to leak through from your poop. Again, what's in your gut is your poop, right? Or will be, um, and it allows those things to leak into your blood, which we don't want. Then we have what's called the mucosal barrier. The mucosal barrier on the surface of your GI cells, there's this layer of mucus, okay? Layer of mucus. And that mucus is very critical, very important. It's a physical barrier 
So it serves a couple of different things. Number one, it, it, it lays down a physical barrier so things can't penetrate in. Number two, it serves as a home in a sense for good bacteria. So the healthy microbiome, those healthy bacteria live, they adhere into that mucus lining and they serve to help protect us. They also talk to, again, these friendly bacteria talk to the gulp. They talk to the immune system. These friendly bacteria live in that mucosal barrier, in that mucus. It's so very, very important. If you've ever eaten a piece of food, if you've ever eaten something and you started getting a lot of uh, phlegm production, having to clear your throat super frequently, this is your body's immune system producing more mucus to protect you from something in the food that you just ate. So this, again, very, very important. And again, the friendly bacteria, they do something called immune crosstalk. They talk to your immune system and your immune system talks back to them. And why would they do that? They, they talk to each other, they communicate about the contents of your GI tract so that they can prepare for things that might be dangerous or, or bad or harmful for you. This immune crosstalk, very important. That's just one of the functions of the good bacteria. So that immune crosstalk, we'll call it function number one of good bacteria. Other functions of the good bacteria is they actually help produce mucin. Mucin, again, that's their home, right? They produce what they live in, which helps with that mucus barrier, that mucus lining. A third function of these good bacteria is vitamin production. They make or help you make vitamins. Um, they also, number, th number, we're on number four here, they help you digest your food. So these bacteria, we want them there. And a lot of people, you know, we think about things like antibiotics, an easy way to destroy the gut lining and to compromise it is to wipe out your friendly bacteria. So antibiotics do that. We'll get into that in just a little bit. Um, then we come over here to this fifth barrier. This barrier is your stomach acid. And this is another one that people medicate into oblivion, unfortunately. Stomach acid's critical, it's important. And, and it's important to also understand that the symptoms, a lot of times people talk about reflux. Oh, I, I feel like you know acid reflux. Um, most of the time, acid reflux symptoms are not too much acid, increases in acid. It's actually not enough acid. So a lot of people that think they have acid reflux actually have low acid production. They're not the same thing, but the symptoms are very similar. Now, the way to differentiate, if you go to your doctor, uh, they usually can do a scope and they can kind of look in there. And what the scope tells the, the GI doctor is the scope will tell us whether or not there's inflammation directly in the esophagus or the stomach. It won't tell us why the inflammation's there, but the assumption is always there. Most GI doctors assume that the redness or the inflammation is too much stomach acid. And I would challenge that assumption is wrong in most people. It's not too much stomach acid. It's that you're doing something that irritates the stomach. What irritates the stomach? For most people, it's their diet. It's bad diet, wrong diet, diet, food sensitivity, food allergy, gluten, uh, food chemicals, and other compounds that are found uh, in food that don't belong in your stomach that create an irritation to your stomach leading to the symptoms of acid reflux. But again, it's not acid, it's irritation that leads to inflammation that gets diagnosed as acid reflux. And then the doctor, usually what do they want to do? They want to prescribe, uh, they want to prescribe an, an anti-acid or an acid blocker. And when you block acid, if, if acid is not the problem, what you actually do, understand why we're talking about acid. Stomach acid is a barrier. When you block that acid, you increase your risk for the development of infection. So this is how the acid, when you eat food, there's a lot of bacteria, there's viruses, there's all kinds of microorganisms in that food, naturally, okay? And when you swallow that food, your stomach acid neutralizes a lot of those potential bad guys or pathogens. And when it neutralizes them, now they can't get down lower into your mucosal barrier and penetrate through a leaky gut, right? So this is a very strong barrier that helps prevent infection, but that acid's also important in digestion. So it's not just preventing infection, but it helps you to digest. And one of the things that helps you to digest is protein. 
protein important uh, because protein is the building block for healing and repair. And many of you struggling with chronic inflammation or chronic inflammatory diseases are struggling on this front. You're not, maybe not getting enough protein, enough of the building blocks, the amino acids to help you heal and repair. This is super critical. But the other function of the stomach acid is absorption. So it helps you digest protein, but it also helps you absorb nutrients. And so vitamins like B12 and calcium and magnesium and iron, all of these uh, require acid to be properly absorbed. And so when you block stomach acid, you now create vitamin and mineral deficiencies vitamin and mineral deficiencies that can damage you. Let me, let me give you an example. Let's make a little bit of room here. Let's, uh, let's see, let's just shrink this up. So if you cause, for example, a vitamin B12 deficiency, well, why do you need B12? B2, let's change our color here. So B12, helps to synthesize new DNA and RNA, which is important for cell production or cell replication. So new cells are produced as a result of B12, right? Now your gut cells, they live every two to seven days. Your gut lining is new. If you don't have adequate B12, what happens is your gut lining can't replicate new cells efficiently. And so what happens is cells get really old and they start breaking down and they start losing their function. We know that B12 deficiency, okay, reduces gut function and predisposes to intestinal permeability or leaky gut. We see this probably most commonly in cancer patients who are on medicines that destroy the gut lining uh, in order for those cancer patients to recover uh, their guts functionally, we need a lot of B12 to make up the difference. B12 and also folate, another important one for gut cellular repair and turnover. So what ends up happening is their gut function deteriorates rather quickly. When your gut function deteriorates, you can't eat, you can't digest, you can't get nutrients from the food, you can't heal, you can't repair. So again, this is just an example of why we need that acid, right? And if you go, if you go pop in the Tums, the Rolades, the antacids, right? The, even the prescription or over-the-counter ones, you're gonna end up causing mal maldigestion, malabsorption of these very, very critical nutrients that are important for your overall gut function, and thus you're gonna create a vicious cycle of compromising whether or not your gut is capable of healing. Remember this statistic, 60% of gut nutrition is your food that you eat directly, okay? Meaning that your gut, unlike other organs and other tissues in your body, the nutrients are processed and then dispersed through the bloodstream. But your gut directly gets 60% of its nutrients from the food, from the lumen of the intestinal lining. So if you're compromised in your ability to digest, then your gut comprom becomes compromised first. And so when your gut is malnourished, the rest of your body over time starts to become malnourished. And this is again why it's such a vicious cycle. Hey, don't forget to check out the rest of the series right here. Make sure you hit subscribe below. And as always, thanks for tuning in.